Well, okay. Well, let's go ahead and kick off, guys. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We have a very special guest, Candace Klein, who's going to be talking to us about crowdfunding and the different kinds of crowdfunding sites that are out there and how to build a crowd for your crowdfunding campaign. I met Candace back in Las Vegas last year at the first crowdfunding conference and was very impressed by the information she gave to the audience and what she's done with her company, SomoLend, which is a peer-to-peer -peer lending site. And we're glad to have her with us today to share with her what she knows about the crowdfunding world as she's one of the leaders in this area helping with the JOBS Act and move the industry forward. So with that, let me introduce you to Candace and have her kick off and take us through this process. Candace, are you there? I am. Thank you so much, Hall, for having me. And thanks, everyone, for signing in today. Hopefully, we can uh, give you some information that you can uh, go and, and become wildly successful with your next fundraise uh, with the data that you learned from me. Um, again, I'm with SOMO Lend, which stands for Social Mobile Local Lending. And we are a debt-based crowdfunding platform. We're already live and have been for almost a year. And we've been facilitating loans from friends, family, customers, neighbors, accredited investors, and banks. Today I'm here to talk to you, though, about um, a number of different uh, elements of crowdfunding um, to walk you through um, the four different kinds of crowdfunding and which can be most useful for your type of business, um, as well as some specific tips and tricks that can help you to um, build the most successful crowdfunding campaign. So uh, starting out, and, and just as in my initial uh, slide or two, I think it's important to understand how many of us there are out there. Us, I'm meaning um, entrepreneurs who need money but can't get it. Um, there, according to the SBA, there are 27 million sm small businesses in the United States that need access to capital. And the Federal Reserve recently reported that of those of us who need money, 23% never apply for fear of rejection. And of those of us who do apply, we're turned down 51% of the time. So that means there's 20 million of us who need capital but can't find it. And at the same time, individuals and corporations are no longer happy with their stock market returns and their passive savings. And so they're taking their investment portfolios back into their own hands, and they're investing um, in those businesses that they already know and love. Um, these two problems have created the perfect storm for crowdfunding or peer-to-peer -peer lending, whichever you choose to call it, um, and depending on the industry. Um, but it's, it's something that's definitely a phenomenon worth paying attention to. Um, and so specifically, um, crowdfunding has, has been a, 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 growing, uh, a growing industry. Um, there are 400, or actually 530 now crowdfunding platforms as of July of last year across the globe. Um, and the, they're primarily located in the United States. What's more important is that $1.5 billion was raised last year alone, or 2011, sorry, alone, in donation reward-based crowdfunding campaigns. And $837 million of that was raised right here in the U.S. Um, now, when we talk about crowdfunding, I think it's important to first understand that there are four different kinds of crowdfunding. And, um, and the two that you see on the right of this screen, reward and donation-based crowdfunding, are already live today. So that these are the types that you would already see on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Rocket Hub, Peerbackers, and others. Um, this allows you to donate your money um, or pre-purchase the watch, but it does not allow you to get any kind of return on your investment. The other two forms of crowdfunding that do provide a return on investment are equity-based and lending-based. And I'll actually go into each of these in more detail as we continue on. So first, let's talk about reward-based. Um, reward-based is the pre-purchase. This is the, the Pebble Watch that any of us have heard um, by now. And this, this simply means that in return for money, you get something. You get an item. Uh, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of corporations, a lot of startups are using this to um, sell prototypes to determine if there's demand for different, certain colors, certain sizes, certain price points for your product. Um, and I apologize, I see a typo. Um, so for financial backing, you provide a reward or item of service. In this particular instance, you, the, the entrepreneur or the fundraiser, and the person giving you the money is the purchaser. Um, this is great for certain types of, of companies. Um, you're tapping into um, uh, a group of people who, who want to be the first, who, who want to own something before it's available on the open market. And so this is a, an interesting niche uh, of potential donors. Um, and obviously, Indiegogo and Kickstarter are the two most well-known platforms to allow for this. 
Now, for donation-based, this is actually great for nonprofits. Um, so the first is great for consumer products. This is great for nonprofits or those who have a great um, story to tell. Um, and so it, you ask the, the crowd to donate in exchange for appreciation. Um, and this can mean anything from um, having your name in the credits of your movie to being, actually being a character in your movie. There are a lot of different things that you can do with that. And in this case, um, uh, the, the person is the donor. Um, on Indiegogo, I think it's interesting to note uh, that donors are, are able to get a tax, uh, a, a, ta a positive tax treatment for making a donation if the, uh, if the fundraiser is a 501c3. That is not the case on Kickstarter. So if you're a nonprofit, I strongly encourage you to check out Indiegogo. Um, so again, this is great for uh, creative and nonprofits, primarily. Um, and uh, so, so again, the, the sites are quite, quite similar, and the strategies are similar between rewards and donations. Now, for equity-based crowdfunding, this is what we keep hearing about. Um, yes, I'm sure you've heard uh, presentations. Some of you may have attended presentations where people talk about the job that. I am not going to be talking about that today um, because, quite honestly, there's not that much happening yet with the job that. But this will allow for investors to secure stock in exchange for their investment. So uh, what's important is that you go from being the fundraiser at Montpelier to the issuer, this is your legally defined term, um, you are providing a staking your company for investment to an investor. This is great for startups, particularly, um, who, uh, and, and honestly for startups who are not necessarily in Silicon Valley um, or in New York or Boston, where it may be more difficult for you to find sources of capital. I'm located and originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. And I had to pitch 250 angel investors before I was able to secure my financing. Um, and so I, I understand the pain that, that we most of us have that aren't located in Silicon Valley. Um, and there are great platforms that are already up and running in some limited capacity. Circle Up is working already with companies who have a million dollars or more in revenue. Seed Invest is doing some very limited um, of, of, uh, campaigns right now. Um, Fundable is doing some limited campaigns. Um, Funders Club is relatively new. You might have read about them over the past few days. Um, and We Funder, all of them are actively doing uh, a handful of deals at a time right now. Um, this is a great group. Uh, this is a great way to reach out to your friends and family members to give them a stake in your business, as well as accredited investors and angel groups. And what we're learning is that many, many angel groups are intrigued by this new form of crowdfunding. So you're not just getting the crowd. You're also getting potentially more savvy. And now, finally, is debt-based. Um, and this is the type of, of platform that SomoLend is. Um, so you, as a borrower, are providing an interest rate. You're paying the money and providing an interest rate return over time to a lender. Um, it's important that you know that you are paying the money back. So this is very different than the first three forms. This is actually meant for more established companies, for restaurants, retailers that already have customers, already have loyal customers who would want to grow as you grow. Um, there are two platforms that are live today for consumer loans, and those are Prosper and Lending Club, and then SOMO Lend for commercial debt. And this is great. Um, the crowd that you're tapping into here is much more tied to your customers, your existing friends and family, and your own community. So this is very local, location-based. Now, how do, you have, how do you build a successful campaign if you're choosing to do a crowdfunding campaign going forward? There are some very simple tips and tricks that we've learned over time. I've now worked with about 330, platform, or, I'm sorry, 330 entrepreneurs to do crowdfunding campaigns across the country. 250 of those entrepreneurs have been successful with their campaigns, and so I'm teaching you what I've learned from them. The first tip that I would, uh, that I would tell you to work on is to create a, uh, a focus around a passionate niche. Now that niche can be um, based on your geography, your location, a religion. Um, maybe uh, you share the same background. So maybe you're tapping into um, the hiker niche or um, the nutritional, um, the nutritional niche or uh, the green niche. Um, but it's important for you to think through who that is first. For you to become very closely and, and tightly ingrained in that community. For you to subscribe to all the publications that those people would, would, would read. Um, for you to get on all of these social networking platforms that those people would be interested in. Um, because you're going to end up using that later in, in your campaign. Now many of you have probably heard of Karen the Bus Monitor. 
Um, and if you hadn't, uh, this is one of my favorite stories for crowdfunding. But uh, Karen the bus monitor was being bullied um, by the students on her bus. And someone, uh, the story, when the story hit, someone felt very bad for her and set up a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter to uh, raise money to send Karen on vacation. Their goal was $7,000, and they raised more than $700,000. Um, and this is what can happen if you have a good enough story that, that can build a large enough audience. And so how do you do that? Um, well, the first thing that you need to think through is passionately pitching your product um, or your project. And so you need to find a way to stand out. Think about your brand up front. If you are a, uh, a stealth company, this is not for you. You've got to be ready to be extremely public with your brand. You need to think about your description, and your description is so much more than what your product does. I get so sick of seeing campaigns um, on crowdfunding platforms that the entire, the entire pitch is just a, you know, um, different shots of the same product. Um, we want to know about you, the entrepreneur, your story. What makes this a, a, the most compelling thing in your world and why you are so passionate about it. Um, and I will say that a video is paramount to a successful campaign. You don't have to spend a lot of money on videos. Most videos will cost you less than $250 and you can even use your own iPhone to create that video. Um, but a video makes a campaign 114% more successful than a campaign without one. Now, you need to think about um, how you're going to prepare for your crowdfunding uh, campaign. If you think that you set up a campaign, your campaign page, and then your work begins, um, you've thought wrong. If you're going to be doing a campaign, you should be preparing for that campaign 30 to 45 days in advance. And I would encourage you to set up a 90 to 115 day calendar that to capture what you will do before your campaign, what you'll do during your campaign, and what you'll do after your campaign ends. So before your campaign, what do you do to prepare? I would encourage you to think through getting yourself a list of five to ten very influential friends to help you with your campaign. And when I say influential, I mean friends who've got blogs that have a ton of readers, friends who have maxed out on other Facebook friends and have 5,000 or more Facebook friends, friends who will be willing to do posts on your behalf to hit a much larger audience. And put those friends on a calendar. So that you know that every Tuesday during your campaign, this one, this particular friend is going to do some posting on your behalf. Or two times during your campaign, one of your friends will write a blog on your behalf. Plan all of that out in advance and let them know. Put them on your calendar so they have the deliverables and they, they're ready to, to, to partner with you. Also be thinking through whether you want to have events. What we've learned is that crowdfunding campaigns that have an event prior to the kickoff where you raise awareness and soft circle some money, an event somewhere in the middle, and a thank you event somewhere at the end are going to be the most successful campaigns. So you want to plan all of these things out. And in planning, you need to think through um, uh, emails that you're going to be sending out. You don't want to um, spam people's inboxes. So you actually want to schedule your email days in advance. Um, it's great to, to think through sending only one email per week. Um, if you send more than one email every five days, people will stop paying attention to it, um, and it will become noise. Um, it's important to not lose interest in the middle of your campaign. What we've learned is the most successful days in a campaign are the first seven and the last seven. So it's important in the middle to keep momentum up. You can do that by um, accomplishing some milestones during that period of time, by posting some interesting video, uh, showing your prototype work and what you're doing right now on your product and your project. And more and most importantly, think through how you're going to spend the money in advance. Get as much detail as you can on that. It will, it will help you out immensely when you actually have your campaign. Now, photos and video. Why are these so important? Um, I, I like to equate uh, crowdfunding and basically any kind of investing in a business uh, to dating. And uh, it, it, just like on Match.com, no one would ever get a date if they didn't put their photos on the platform. It's very similar in crowdfunding. People who are going to give you their money, they want to know you. They want to feel a personal connection to the founder, to, uh, to the, the, the person who's creating this new project or product. And so photos and videos are imperative to your success. 
Uh, just a, a tip or trick is that your video should be no longer than 2 minutes and 30 seconds at the absolute longest. The most successful videos are 2 minutes long. Goals and rewards. Um, it's, it's important to think through what you're going to offer as rewards ahead of time. We've learned that having several levels is imperative, it's very important. So just selling your product is not good enough. You need to think through at least three and up to eight different reward levels. And let me encourage you to think through intangible rewards. Um, and here's why. One of the things that crowdfunders do a very bad job of is planning out the cost of shipment. And so if you, if you say, you know, for $5, I'll give you a keychain, you, you need to think through how much it will actually cost you to manufacture and ship that keychain. And you have to remember the fact that many people who are contributing, contributing to your campaign may be in other countries. And shipping to Cambodia, for instance, is about $22. And so the more intangible uh, offerings that you can, or, or, or rewards you can offer, the better off you'll be. This is great for, you know, if you're a, a business owner to offer naming rights, um, the naming of products, the naming of menu items, um, putting people's names in credits, um, having uh, events with, with, with the people that, you're, that, you're, um, that are making contributions. Um, an interesting one that we saw for a film that did a crowdfunding campaign was the, they offered the ability to hold the boom mic for a day on the set. And um, I don't know who on the, in their right mind would actually want to hold the boom mic on a TV production set. But two people paid $1,000 to have that opportunity. And so the more creative you are with your intangibles, the more money you'll be able to receive for them. Now, using social media is extremely important uh, for a successful crowdfunding campaign. The reason why is that only 20% of the American public even knows what crowdfunding is. But everyone is familiar with social media at this point in time. Um, so this is a great way to network, to market your product. It's important to con consistently keep people updated on as many different platforms as you can. As you can. Um, to tweet, use Facebook posts, LinkedIn, Pinterest. Use all of these to your advantage. Um, and follow the people who are, who are um, going to be your donors after they've made a donation. Now, that's important for building a relationship. You need to think about where are your potential donors going to be, on what site, what do they listen to, what do they care about. Get as much information about your potential donors slash customers as you possibly can, and then use those to your advantage. Build groups out. Um, one of the things that, that we've, we've uh, had great luck with is with the media. So if, if you want to get your product in TechCrunch when you do a crowdfunding campaign, you don't send a press release. That doesn't work for TechCrunch. What you do is you start following your favorite TechCrunch reporters on Twitter. And then when it's time for you to do your campaign, you actually shout out to them after the fact, after they already know you and after they know that you've been following them. So that's why it's important to plan ahead of time prior to actually doing your campaign. Now it's also important to stay active throughout the campaign. You should be providing updates on your campaign page every one to five days. Um, and these should be a combination of photos, video, and text. And finally, it's important for you to find some consistent way of thanking your donors or, or your investors. And um, doing something specific for them is very important. Now, email I actually don't recommend. I actually do recommend doing some kind of handwritten or personalized uh, thank you. Shout outs are helpful, but they're not that great. Um, people want to have a personal connection to you. Finally, I mentioned it earlier, milestones. And I think it's important for you to um, plan on, on hitting specific milestones during your campaign. You can, by the way, have already hit these milestones prior to launching your campaign. Just don't share them yet. Don't make them public. So for instance, one of the restaurants that I just helped, they just bought all new chairs prior to you know, two days before they launched their campaign. What they said was, if we can raise $10,000 of our $50,000 goal, if we can raise $10,000, we will be able to buy new chairs. Once they hit $10,000 in their campaign, they announced the new chairs. Now, the new chairs were already in the restaurant, but none of the crowdfunding people, the donors in the crowdfunding campaign knew that. And so it's important for you to think through what milestones you can communicate to keep people excited throughout the, those, middle, those middle days, boring days in the middle of your campaign. There are some mistakes that I have seen over and over and over again, and so I always like to, to point these out. Be careful with setting your expectations. 
And um, what I'll say about this is um, make your funding goal as low as you possibly can. Um, there's, there's no penalty for knocking it out of the park and raising a heck of a lot more than what you planned. There are, however, penalties for not meeting your goal. So rather than posting a $500,000 funding goal, think about the least amount of money that you could possibly survive on to deliver on your promises and get your product out the door. And then focus on blowing that number out of the water. The next is it, the, the, the um, assumption that if I build it, they will come. Not true. And in fact, what we've learned is that campaigns that are able to raise 25 to 30 percent of their goal before they ever launch the campaign are about 300 times more successful than campaigns that start their campaign with zero dollars raised. So that's why it's important for you to have a, a you know a pre-kickoff event to try to get to 25 percent of your goal before you ever launch your campaign. And here's why. We all get super excited when we do a crowdfunding campaign. We send out a press release the day that we launch, and we say, hey, world, come check us out. So then Forbes or Fast Company or Entrepreneur Magazine log on to your crowdfunding campaign because they think it sounds interesting, and they see that you haven't even raised $5. And they say, what, your parents don't even care about this enough to invest? So you want to think about that in advance. Again, like dating, everyone, I equate this to dating in high school, everyone wants to date a football player because everyone wants to date a football player. We like successful people. We like to invest in successful people. And so go ahead and, and do everything you can to create that, um, that, in, that interpretation or illusion of success very early on in your campaign. And finally, I'll say small donations are very important. One of the things that we've learned is that when someone invests a small amount of money at the very the first week of the campaign, they're far more likely to invest a large dollar amount by the end of the campaign. So please do not discount those small donations. Now, if you're going into equity and debt, I think it's important to know that there are going to be a few additional expectations of you um, above and beyond your video and your story. You're going to actually have to provide your business plan. <laughs> and so think through uh, if you've answered the, the important questions of the uniqueness of your product and who your competitors are. Um, the people who are investing through debt and equity already know who your competitors are. And so you need to know this and you need to communicate it. And you need to under you need to plan or, or talk talk your investors through how you're going to make money off of the money that you're raising right now. Um, and that you've thought through a plan for for marketing and selling your product. Your management team becomes much more important in a debt and equity uh, raise than it is on a donation based raise. Um, and your investors are specifically looking for skill sets and that your team has the right skill sets to be successful. And finally, financials. You will have to provide financials um, for any equity or debt raise. So uh, you're going to have to get comfortable with that now um, before you actually uh, start your campaign. Finally, with intellectual property, do not include it. Um, you do not have to include patent applications. If you have trademarks, um, you don't have to include those applications. There is a way to talk about your secret sauce in a in general enough term um, that you will be uh, that you'll be able to communicate your business successfully without sharing your your intellectual property. And if you have specific questions on intellectual property, feel free to reach out to me after today's webinar. Finally, I just think it's fun for you to see some examples of some good and bad campaigns. Um, and so uh, there are there are very clear examples of successful campaigns. The Stick and Find, um, the Stick and Find campaign is closed. They they were uh, they raised two hundred thousand dollars more than they than they um, were seeking, and they had a phenomenal video. They really explained um, not only how the product worked and why it was important, but what made what made the founder so passionate about it. And they had a very detailed plan for how they were going to actually spend their money. I encourage you to check out these campaigns on Indiegogo and Kickstarter. Um, and so uh, what we learned about the Stick and Find is that they, they did a great job of waiting to send out their press release until they actually had raised some money. Um, they posted their photos every three days on their campaign. Um, they gave a frequently asked questions um, section in their storyline. Um, for people who had already used their product, which was extremely helpful, and they had a project timeline. So these are things that you can clearly do um, to make your campaign more successful. 
Um, next is the Pebble Watch. Obviously, everyone talks about that. They were, you know, had 11,000 percent over over their goal. They raised 11 million dollars in their 30-day campaign. Um, and the, the reasons for this is they had, they had a great explanation of their product. They showed how and where you could use the product. Um, but what's interesting is their reward system allowed people to pay money to vote on the next new color. And that was actually their most successful reward level, was letting people vote on a color. And if you haven't seen, this is the Pebble campaign. You can actually pull this up on And two that are unsuccessful, one on Kickstarter and one on Indiegogo. The Ninja Baseball, um, check it out. It's awful. Um, and uh, I'd encourage you to tell me what you think um, when you see it. Um, there is no video. Um, and there is very little information. Um, they had a ridiculously high goal, and they simply said, I have an idea, give me a million dollars. And um, that is the opposite of what you want to do. Um, the same thing with All My Friends documentary. It's a documentary, and they didn't do any video, <laughs> um, which was interesting. Um, so these are two that, that I kind of highlight as my least favorite in the history of crowdfunding campaigns. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to check out and see why. I'm sure you'll probably have your own critique. Um, and so at this time, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, provide any more detailed information, um, and open uh, any dialogue. Well, great, Candice. Thank you so much. For those in the audience, there's a question box on the screen. Several of you have already entered in questions there. We'll read them out, and Candice will address them. So go ahead and type in your questions as we go through this, and we'll make sure we answer them in today's session. Uh, the first question that came up, Candice, is you talked about the cost for a video. What do you see out there as people paying for videos, and how much should they cost to make? So um, I, I will tell you that there are a number of production companies who, who are already doing crowdfunding videos all over the country. I've used them in nearly every state. Uh, it should not cost you more than $250 to create a two-minute video. Um, and quite honestly, uh, you can do – I've seen just as many successful campaigns using their own iPhone and uh, open source apps online um, to do their own dubbing. Um, as those who've paid someone else to do it, um, but you should not be—you should not have to spend more than two hundred and fifty dollars. Now, if you are—if you're creative and listening on this call, there's a higher expectation of you. <laughs> um, and quite honestly, you're supposed to know the cost <laughs> um, if you're creative, um, because you're creating a film. So um, those those uh, costs are typically much higher, um, but they're for very specialized fields. Okay. What are the total amounts for a crowdfunding uh, campaign, uh, customary and usual, or if there's a top and bottom figure? And since you mentioned uh, four different kinds, can you state the amount or the typical amount people are raising on peer-to-peer -peer lending, equity, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the rewards uh, payment kind? Sure. So um, reward platforms, um, they range from a $500 goal to um, a five million dollar goal, um, the average uh, fundraisers on on um, Kickstarter and Indiegogo primarily are about fifteen thousand, fifteen to fifty thousand. Um, and and of the successful campaigns, the initial goals were between fifteen and fifty thousand on average. Um, it's interesting, um, Hall, that you mentioned equity and debt because they're very different numbers. So for equity crowdfunding campaigns. The average request is at least two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, up to a million, um, and we, we've seen um, you know a, a nice median right around four hundred thousand um, dollars. For debt, the average request is about fifty to seventy-five thousand, and and the successful campaigns are again at about fifty to seventy-five thousand. Okay, great. Um... Here's a great request. It says, thank you for this wonderful webinar. I have already learned a lot. I am currently running a Kickstarter campaign and am four days in. Would you be able to look at it and offer me advice on exceeding my goal? Sure. So if any of you are on the call today and um, either have campaigns or have specific questions after today's call, please do feel free to um, shoot an email over to me and my team. Um, there are seven of us who, who have helped with these 330 campaigns. Um, so please send an email to info, I-N-F-O, at somolens.com, and I'll make sure that somebody can re reach out to you and give you some feedback. All right, great. Uh, next one is, um, 
is this for equity base or not for profit that has no equity when you were talking about the uh, the video costs? Oh, um, so the video costs are essentially across the board. Um, nearly every platform allows you to upload a video. And so um, even if you're, I mean, if you're not, if you're not for profit, you'll be just as successful doing the video yourself as, as paying someone else. But what I'm saying is that it should not cost you thousands of dollars, um, no matter what kind of campaign you're doing, to okay. put your video together. All right. Is there a directory of crowdfunding sites that can help us find the one most appropriate for our concept? Yes. Uh, I don't know if it's a directory, but there is a listing of um, all of the crowdfunding platforms that are live as of today. That listing can be found at crowdsourcing.org, and um, they issued a crowdfunding report in July of 2012 that has the listing of all of those platforms. Right. Are you available for consultation? If so, how do we reach you? <laughs> um, I'm not available for consultation only because I'm uh, running a full-time uh, company myself, but uh, feel free if you have any questions to reach out to info at um, and uh, we have, you know, any of my team members would be happy to have a quick call with any of you. Okay. So the next one is just to make sure I have it correct, and so the email address there is info, I-N-F-O, at SOMOLEND, S-O-M-O-L-E-N-D, Dot com, and what I'll do, guys, is I'll I'll send you a copy of the recording, and I'll include the uh, email address in there for you guys to look at that, and you can follow up to Candace directly if you need that. Uh, next question coming up is: You mentioned using your own social network and those of uh, five uh, well-connected friends. What other techniques can you use to build your crowd? So, um, so, and I apologize in advance. I know this is going to be recorded, so sorry, Hall, for this. But I don't know how many of you um, that are listening today um, are fans of Sex and the City, but I'm a huge fan. And um, in one of the in one of the episodes, Samantha's boyfriend was trying to become a famous actor, but um, couldn't couldn't seem to get his audience uh, or get the industry to pay attention to him. And Samantha explained: first come the gays, then come the girls, then come the industry. And what I would say about crowdfunding is a similar concept. You want to get those people who are already in your own social circle committed and drinking the Kool-Aid before you ever get started. You want to find um, some of the most prolific social media people in your own social circle up front and ahead of time. You want to raise your money, um, as, as much of the money as you can, before you ever kick off your campaign. Uh, you want to wait to send out press releases until you've actually hit 30% of your goal. Um, and you want to build a relationship by, by following on Twitter all of those people who are already in your industry who could potentially write an article about you or um, plug you uh, during your campaign. You want to start following those people in advance. Right. Well, that's a good point, Candace. I meet so many people that have launched a crowdfunding campaign, and only then do they start looking for people to help them get the word out. Exactly. <laughs> I tell them, yeah. no, no, that goes before you launch the campaign, not after you start it, because there's so, so short a time on there. Do, do you have any thoughts about different time frames, 30-day, 60- or 90-day campaigns? I do, actually. So the most successful campaigns are 30 to 45 days long. And here's why. After 45 days, your crowd gets bored, and they want to see a success or not, not a success. You're not going to raise any more money. Um, and it's going to be it's going to be a, a de minimis amount of money that you could raise between day 45 and day 90, and it will wear you out to have that long of a campaign. So I strongly encourage shorter campaigns, 30 to 45 days. And how much time do people spend on a campaign if they're running a 30-day campaign? How many hours of the day are they putting in? You need to expect to spend at least four hours a day on your campaign. And if you're not spending four hours a day, it means that you're probably not not doing enough um, to make it successful. You want to be thinking about specific emails, uh, specific uh, ways to reach out. Um, you, you are, this is a campaign for a reason. You are essentially running for office for 30 days. This should be as close to a full-time job for you as possible. And I know that we all have businesses to run, and we all have other things um, buying for our time. But if you're going to do a crowdfunding campaign, it is at least a commitment of four hours a day. Okay, next question is, how do you use current investors to give to generate new investors? Um, so uh, th that's one of the things that uh, events are quite helpful. So um, a lot of the campaigns that I help uh, that I help put together, um, we'll have a, a pre-kickoff campaign with you know the, what we call the mafia dinner, 
where you have 15 to 20 of, of the people who you think will make the largest contribution. Um, and the beauty of that is when you bring people together in the same room, there's social pressure for them to commit to you. And so they're more likely to make a commitment while they're in the room with other people who are making commitments. Then I suggest having a, a, an event of some sort in your home or your business, happy hour or, or something like that, um, about 10 days into your campaign. This is a thank you event for your early supporters where you ask them to help be your champions and your spokespeople for the remainder of the campaign. You ask them to bring on three to five additional funders um, through their own social networks. Um, and then I, I always encourage having a, a close, and you, you can do two of those, by the way, for a campaign, um, and, and, and you know, do one in day 10 and do one at day 20. Um, and those tend to work really well. And then finally, having a closing event. Um, I think too many, of, too many times we get so dependent on social media and technology that we forget about human interaction. And what ultimately, human interaction will always raise you more money if you can incorporate it. Um, so, so I strongly encourage you to do that. I, I heard at the crowdfunding conference that different social media gives you different levels of activity or response. Just likes on Facebook doesn't always transfer into actual payment of dollars. What's your experience there? Yeah, so uh, likes on Facebook aren't worth really anything. Uh, uh, what, what I actually um, like to do is I encourage, and, and Facebook, by the way, is far more helpful um, than, than Twitter. Uh, Twitter is just shouting um, when you're doing a crowdfunding campaign. It's a great way for you to get media, like TechCrunch and Reddit. Um, they'll, they'll typically respond to, to Twitter feed. Um, but if you're trying to actually get supporters, donors, investors, Facebook and LinkedIn are, are, are far more helpful. Um, and what I encourage is for you to actually set up a closed group. And that as people um, like, you invite them into your closed group. Uh, that's a, a second level of commitment that's much more intimate that allows for dialogue, um, it creates a, 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 a stronger sense of camaraderie between you and your Facebook followers. Um, and so uh, I, I strongly, I, I, most of the campaigns I work with set up a closed group and bring people into their closed group throughout their campaign. That's a far, far more lucrative connection on, on social media. How effective is LinkedIn for a crowdfunding campaign? It's okay. Um, it, I haven't found it to be all that helpful. Um, what I have learned is that LinkedIn is, people are using LinkedIn for professional purposes, um, meaning job finding, um, employee searching, um, more employment related uh, purposes um, than, than uh, for, for investment decision making. Um, still, I, I always uh, encourage people to use uh, LinkedIn. I encourage you to set up a closed group though on LinkedIn as well so that you're not um, creating noise. Um, but you're rather only speaking to those people who have expressed an interest in what you're doing. Well, here's an interesting question. Are there other people or companies willing to run a campaign for you? <laughs> yes. The answer is yes. Now, I can't give you the listing of all of them, but I would encourage you just to Google crowdfund consultants. <laughs> um, and there is a whole group of people who are, who are um, now popping up with their own consulting companies to help people with their crowdfunding campaigns. And the follow-on question to that is, what should you look for in hiring one of those consultants? Um, first, I would encourage you that you can do this yourself. Um, I'm not a big fan of the crowdfunding consultants yet because, quite honestly, many of them, and, and, and honestly, I guess, I guess I could have been a crowdfunding consultant if I didn't have a platform myself, um, but many of them haven't run that many successful campaigns. So I would look to, to, at their resume. Um, if someone has done 50 or fewer campaigns, they're not worth your time. Um, and, and for instance, you know, like I've done 330 now. And so you learn, but you only learn with real volume. Um, and if they're looking for a success-based fee, which many of them will, take a really hard look at the percentage and compare. Um, the, average, uh, the average percentage that crowdfunding platforms charge is 7.8% for your successful campaigns. You're already going to lose that amount of money in your campaign. You need to budget that in. Um, consultants typically will tack on another 10%, and so it becomes an expensive assistant, if you will. 
Great, great. Um, are there any other questions, guys, out there? That's been a great uh, session so uh, to date, Candace. We appreciate your giving us all that information. Uh, we will record this and place this online for those who couldn't make it today or would like to go back and review the material. We'll put that back up there. I'll send everybody a copy of the link to it as well as Candace's uh, email address with info at sumolend.com. If you want to check out a peer-to-peer -peer lending site, I recommend you look at her site as she's one of the leading lights in this area, helping set the laws as well as find the right uh, way to uh, provide the service to the uh, to the uh, community as well. What closing words do you have for us, Candace? There. Um, well, I guess my, my my final piece of advice for all of you listening today is to get started now. Do something now. Don't wait until equity-based crowdfunding comes around because it's going to take some time. And the best thing you can do if you want to do an equity raise is to do a donation or reward-based raise first and learn the tips and tricks. You will always be more successful the second time you do a campaign. And so, um, you know, uh, the, the faster you get started, um, the better off you'll be in the long run. And I'm happy to help in the process. Well, great. Well, thanks so much. We appreciate you guys signing in today, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, close it out for now. Thank you for spending your f good Friday afternoon with us, and thank you, Candace, for sharing your information and wisdom with us, and look forward to see you at the next crowdfunding conference, wherever that may be. Thank you, Hall, and thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. You too. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye.